All right, so uh, we'll talk about interatrial shunt therapy, and, and I want to begin by saying this concept has been primarily tested in patients that have heart failure with a preserved ejection fraction. Uh, we know this is prevalent. About 40% of patients with heart failure have this. It's expected to exceed the prevalence of systolic heart failure very soon. But as prevalent as it might be, it's not always obvious, right? These patients have dyspnea. They go from their pulmonologist to their cardiologist. They obviously have a, a normal ejection fraction. They may have a normal brain natriuretic peptide, and they may even have normal resting hemodynamics when they finally make it to the cath lab. But the phenotypic feature that discerns them and explains their dyspnea is that with exercise, they have a disproportionate increase in pulmonary capillary wedge pressure. Wedge pressure of 15, top end of normal can become 35. Uh, so we have a way to diagnose these folks. We also know that exercise hemodynamics have prognostic value. They relate directly to exercise capacity. Elevations in intracardiac pressures precede uh, cardiovascular events. And exercise hemodynamics allow us to better prognosticate from a survival perspective patients with heart failure. But despite this growing awareness of now, hey, we can tell you why you're short of breath and you know what, this is important, these numbers are valid, we've not made really any progress in the therapies for heart failure with a preserved ejection fraction. In fact, look at all of the, the red lines here on the right. These are conventional systolic heart failure therapies that just don't work in patients with a preserved ejection fraction. And so, might a mechanical solution to this problem have merit? If you look even more closely at the 2010 paper that Barry Borlaug out of the Mayo Clinic did where he really uh, established exercise hemodynamics as the way to, to diagnose this condition, you realize that pulmonary capillary wedge pressure in this population increases a considerably greater amount than right atrial pressure, disproportionate increase in pulmonary capillary wedge pressure. So might this be a rationale for an interatrial shunt? That is, allowing left atrial pressure to exhale fill the right atrium when it wants to increase, and thereby relieving pulmonary venous congestion and, and treating the dyspnea. Usually at this point, uh, there's murmurs in the audience or someone shoots up a hand and says something like, wait, I thought you guys were supposed to be closing these, or uh, uh, are you simply trading one problem for another when you talk about putting a shunt in the atrial septum? Uh, those are valid comments, but, but I'll say this concept isn't entirely new. Uh, in the early 1900s, there was a case series of, of patients with something called Lutenbacher syndrome. Uh, these are patients that had a left-sided valvular condition, typically mitral stenosis, but had a coincident VSD. And those patients did much better than the physicians would have anticipated. Uh, one example was a woman that lived to 72 years old uh, and had 11 uncomplicated pregnancies, severe mitral stenosis and an ASD. Uh, the, the group from Chicago in 2001, they taught us that sometimes when you close an atrial septal defect in, in an elderly gentleman, you unmask the hemodynamic, uh, hemodynamic footprint of diastolic heart failure, and it precedes clinical diastolic heart failure. So maybe the ASD is actually protective in some patients. And then perhaps a handful of us in this room have been consulted by our surgical colleagues saying, we have this patient, we cannot get them on, off ECMO, they have profound LV dysfunction. Will you please create a hole in their septum and allow the ventricle to exhale a little bit and hopefully wean them? If we could perhaps employ this strategy in, in a less uh, urgent way, in a more controlled fashion, perhaps we can disrupt the increase in left atrial pressure that precedes exertional dyspnea in patients with diastolic heart failure. And this is precisely uh, the strategy that these trials are employing. So uh, there are three devices that are available. If you look very hard uh, in this space, I'll talk mostly about the Corvia device. It has the most clinical evidence uh, reported for it. Uh, it's a, a 16 French catheter. You get left or, or right femoral venous access. You perform a transseptal puncture in an anticoagulated patient right through the center of the fossa ovalis. Uh, you expose the left atrial legs, retract the device, you make sure the proximal end is in the right atrium, then you expose the right, uh, the right uh, sided legs. What you're left with at the end of all that is an eight millimeter diameter atrial septal defect. Uh, it's been evaluated in a handful of studies. I'll, I'll skip right to the CE Mark study. This was a single arm trial, which means every patient in the trial got the device. It was 64 patients and the phenotype is one you recognize. Uh, more females than males, uh, there's uh, obesity is prevalent and they're hypertensive, okay? Uh, these patients had a mean ejection fraction of around 50 and resting wedge pressure was only 17, but with exercise it went to 35. Uh, the 12 month uh, results from this uh, single arm trial have been reported. Uh, in short, there were improvements in exercise time, exercise distance, improvements in NYHA class, and improvements in exercise pulmonary capillary wedge pressure. 
Importantly, up to 12 months, these shunts remained patent with a QPQS between 1.25 and 1.3. That trial gave way to the first randomized trial in the space. It was called Reduced Lap HF1. 44 patients, pretty small. 22 got the device. 22 had a sham procedure. Uh, the 30-day uh, uh, primary endpoint was reported uh, about a year and a half ago, and what you see on the right side of the screen here, patients that received the uh, interatrial shunt device actually had lower pulmonary capillary wedge pressure upon exercise, where the panel on the left control patients exhibited no such hemodynamic outcome. This was the primary endpoint of that trial, uh, but the 12-month results have uh, been completed. They're going to be presented in their totality next month at ESC. Uh, I will share with you that in the group that received the device, there was more than a 50% reduction in heart failure events. So if you look at the aggregate uh, clinical data uh, with, with this device, it's safe. One year survival is high, freedom from stroke is high, and although it is technically feasible to close these with an ASD closure device, it's not been necessary. There's been no thrombosis and there's been no necessity for a surgical implant, so rather good safety. From an efficacy perspective, if you look at the aggregate of the experience, NYHA class improves, uh, surrogates of quality of life improve, uh, heart failure hospitalizations have been reduced, and the shunt remains patent at 12 months. So this is the reduced LAP HF2 trial. It's currently enrolling. The goal was for more than 600 patients. Uh, the primary outcome is at 12 months now, not 30 days, and it includes things like cardiovascular mortality, heart failure hospitalizations, uh, and, uh, and quality of life scores. I want to spend uh, the last minute and a half here or so to introduce you to a second device that should be entering clinical trials in the U.S. this year. That's the goal. It's called the V-Wave device. Uh, from your chair, you can look at the screen and say, hey, that's larger profile. You're right. It's a larger profile device. It's hourglass glass shaped, uh, and it uh, leaves you not with an 8 millimeter ASD, but with a 5.1 millimeter ASD. I'll share with you that iteration number one of this device contained a valve that only permitted flow from left atrium to right atrium. The, the theory was, well, let's reduce or eliminate the risk of paradoxical embolism. Uh, the initial experience was done primarily in, uh, in Canada. Uh, Dr. Rose Cabot implanted 10 patients. These were sicker patients than were in the other trials I was telling you about, but implant success was high, and the early hemodynamic uh, result is exactly what you would expect. Uh, there's improved pulmonary capillary wedge pressure and an improved ability to, uh, to, to walk. When they uh, expanded this to include more patients and longer follow-up, though, there, there was an unexpected finding. At 12 months, they observed that flow across the shunt was absent or diminished in 50% of the patients. Uh, this was eventually uh, referred to panis ingrowth into the device. So iteration one of the device was scrapped. Iteration two now does not contain the valve that allows unilateral flow. So bidirectional flow is possible through the device. Uh, and they have 12-month large animal data that establishes the patency of the device. Uh, if you simply looked at the patients that had a patent device at 12 months within the early V-Wave experience, the results are what you would expect. Favorable hemodynamic result, favorable quality of life, and NYHA class improvement. So uh, we will await the larger trial here, uh, again, expected to commence later this year. Uh, so uh, to conclude, uh, you, can, you can read the first two bullets. This is one of those spaces where um, long-term follow-up is going to be absolutely critical because if, as you're thinking through what the complications of this class of devices might be, you probably acknowledge that they will be rare events in any, in, in any scenario, right? So long-term follow-up and, and being sure that we don't have things like paradoxical embolism or progressive right-sided heart failure will be critical. Right, thank you. Makes a lot of sense. We're going to be site for this V-Wave uh, clinical trial. It's an interesting trial design, and the control arm is a sham control. So everybody gets a venous access and kind of yeah. spend some time and maybe do a right heart cat. And yeah, we were doing a, I, th I think that's yeah. genius. So uh, the, the fellows were able to come in and do a full cardiac ICE exam on the sedated patients right. for reduce. And, and, uh, and you have to waste the, 30 minutes to. Not uh, just the patient's blinded, but they're evaluating cardiologist who's the non-implanter is also blinded. Correct. So, 